Good, happy Tuesday morning, January 14, 2020. I'm Riley King, and welcome to the Riley King Newscast, right here on the Riley King Network. We have a lot of news to get to this Tuesday morning, so let's begin. First up, icy conditions caused more than a dozen crashes on I-89 North in Sutton, I-93 North of Northfield. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Sharice LeClaire. Spinouts reported in parts of the state. Community College, I'm working with underserved students uh, planning for college. It was not a single course that I took that was all for not every single bit of it was helpful. But I've been involved in research, I have a job on campus, I'm involved in clubs, I've had internship experiences, everything. I had a child between my two degrees and I wanted to stay local. It's great for all of us if graduates stay here in New Hampshire. Visit WMUR.com. Cars spinning everywhere. A chaotic night on the roads for many tonight after freezing drizzle, coated highways, and thin black ice. More than a dozen crashes in areas north of Northfield on 93 and north of Sutton on 89. George and Debbie LaSure and their dog Woody were heading home to Vermont tonight. Going along in the right-hand lane and all of a sudden the van was going sideways down the road. So with no warning, no notice, the car behind us was also fishtailing. They ended up in this ditch, Debbie doing all she could to keep the crash from becoming more serious. It's right. like ice right here, and uh, you know, there was nothing we could do. I just was like, hold on to the steering wheel, don't jerk it, don't hit the brakes, don't do any of those things. Just try to steer it so I steered it right over the best I could going straight off the road, because otherwise... If I jerked the wheel, I was going to spin off the road. State police responding to the crashes that closed down both sides of 89 near New London. We're getting cars off the road. We're getting rollovers. Um, we're getting vehicles striking other vehicles. Debbie says they're lucky the cars around them didn't hit their van as it spun out of control. While it was a terrifying few moments, they're all okay. It's the first accident I've ever had. And what an yeah. it was. But we're okay. That's so what that's what and matters. Yeah, we're relieved they're okay tonight. Them and their dog uh, safe after that scary ordeal. Now, state police say things have now calmed down quite a bit from earlier this evening after Salters hit the roads tonight. Live in Concord, I'm Sharice LeClaire, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Repairs continue after gas main break cuts service to more than 300 in Salem. Excavator doing drainage work hits gas main, officials say. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Mike Cronin. We're constantly hiring and looking to add great talent to our team. Franklin Pierce classes were small, and the curriculum included real-world scenarios, which helped prepare me for the workforce. I'm planning to transfer to SNHU, where I'm going to continue my communication degree. I've had great experiences at both uh, UNH and at Mass College of Pharmacy. Visit WMUR.com. Businesses forced to close tonight, a natural gas leak impacting 335 customers in one of the busiest areas of Salem. For care homes like Salem Haven, that means no heat, hot water, or cooking. We monitor the temperatures, keep the residents comfortable, notify their families and, and loved ones. This facility among the first to get service back tonight. 
the nursing home and the two assisted livings in town are the priority. This morning, firefighters say an excavator hit a six-inch main gas line on Route 28 as part of a major restoration project. Officials say the line wasn't properly marked. We believe that this is an error perhaps in the location mock-out uh, at no fault of the contractor at this time. The leak was contained without anyone getting hurt, but the work is far from over. With the line repaired, now 16 Unitil technicians going door to door until about midnight to get people back online. If anybody isn't home at that time, we leave a notification for them to give us a call. We'll have crews still in the area. We'll go back out. We'll get them on. That process will finish tomorrow. Meantime, a warning from firefighters. If they smell gas, uh, to call us. We'll come check your house, uh, check your business to make sure there's not a gas problem in your house tonight. Despite the hassle, Salem Haven was ready for the unexpected. Ironically, just last month we had a disaster drill and the scenario was this um, loss of heat uh, due to loss of natural gas. I actually just saw a Unitil truck drive by us, so this restoration process is going on right now. Salem did open its, its emergency operations center today and says all of the agencies involved are working together to resolve this issue quickly. Reporting live in Salem, Mike Cronin, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Sexual assault survivors face attacker at sentencing. Accused of sexually assaulting four girls between late 1980s through 2000. Let's take a listen to that video from NBC5 in Vermont area and upstate New York area. We're constantly hiring and looking to add great talent to our team. It was an emotional day in court as Alan Workalove pleaded guilty to six more charges during his sentencing after being found guilty last month on sex assault charges. You took my childhood away from me, Alan. A sexual assault survivor delivering a strong message directly to Alan Workala. He was accused of sexually assaulting four girls between the late 1980s through 2002 in the Claremont area. From this day forth, you will be no longer able to find any more victims. I am sorry to all the survivors that became your victim due to me, my fear of telling, of not telling anyone what happened to me. But I am proud of them for still walking in the forward direction. Back in December, the 52-year-old was found guilty on two counts of aggravated felonious sexual assault. Along with his sentencing on Monday, Workle had pleaded guilty to his other outstanding crimes after reaching a deal with prosecutors. I have dreamed of this day for as long as I can remember. Four survivors spoke directly to Workala. For years, I have been reminded of the power your actions have and continue to hold over my life. You took a part of me away when I was a child that I'll never get back. I have nightmares. I'll never get over it. But one survivor now forgiving the man who is now part of her past. For everything that you have caused in my life, regardless of how direct or indirect these actions have, not because you deserve my forgiveness but because I deserve my own peace. Workala also pleaded guilty to assaulting an inmate at the Sullivan County House of Corrections and was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years behind bars. In Newport, Matt Layton, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Man says he was physically sexually abused at New Hampshire Youth Detention Center. David Mann is lead plaintiff in class action lawsuit against several agencies. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Kristen Carosa.
New Hampshire, your road to higher education. There's workforce needs in New Hampshire across the board right now. I got the classroom experience and brought it right into the workforce. Real small class sizes, I knew all of my professors personally, had some great research opportunities. Community colleges offer affordable tuition along with a wide range of classes and options and a diverse group of people. I really feel prepared for my future career. Visit WMUR.com. I couldn't hold it in anymore. David Meehan says he spent several years at the Youth Detention Center and while there was physically and sexually abused by staff. Realizing that none of this was my fault, I'm here to show that I'm stronger than that. Now he's the lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit with 35 others against several state agencies for what allegedly happened. We have the ability to keep this from ever happening again. David Meehan is the strongest man that I have ever met in my entire life. Their attorney says the plaintiffs were between 11 and 17 at the time and at the center between 1982 and 2014. When they were physically abused, sexually abused, mentally and emotionally abused, held in solitary confinement for extended periods of time and deprived of education. Attorney Russ Riley tells us there are 13 defendants named in this lawsuit, but he anticipates that number will continue to grow. These types of lawsuits can shine a light on broken systems, and that's exactly what this is going to do, and it's going to show the public um, a system that's been broken for many years. The lawsuit comes just months after two former counselors were charged with the alleged sexual assault of a teenage boy at the Youth Services Center in the late 1990s. One of the men involved has pleaded not guilty. The lawyer for the other says he denies all of the charges. Right now there is an ongoing investigation. The governor says the state remains vigilant in getting to the bottom of it to ensure justice is served. David hopes by telling his story it will encourage other potential victims to come forward. I'm hoping we'll realize that this is our chance now to heal from this and hold these people accountable. In Manchester, Kristen Carosa, WMUR, News Not. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Video shows corrections officer being attacked by inmate officials say. Officer seriously injured in attack. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Amy Cavino. constantly hiring and looking to add great talent to our team. Franklin Pierce. It was a quick response, thank God, that the sergeant and lieutenant got there and intercepted. Officer Rodriguez, a veteran with 10 years experience, serving lunch just before 11 a.m. Saturday. When he got to Matthew Dion's cell on the second floor, the inmate burst out. And multiple times, he was the officer was struck in the head and face area, uh, went down onto the ground, uh, wrestling, still receiving uh, assault of punches by the inmate. The control room officer sees the attack. Code 1034, officer down. In 20 seconds, help arrives, but it's not over yet. The Sergeant Barnes is the one that got the individual down on the ground. The individual also kicked uh, Sergeant Barnes in the groin stomach area. Corrections officers are not armed. They have a radio and pepper spray. They used both. Officer Rodriguez was carried out on a stretcher. I dread that phone call to the family member to let them know that they're in the hospital or something happened to them. The superintendent says Matthew Dion has been in the jail for 145 days. Preventative detention. Charges of simple assault, resisting arrest, and criminal mischief. He's homeless. He's a management challenge right now. He will be cuffed and shackled every time he comes out. And his meals now served through a food portal. The superintendent says it could have been worse. A railing, the stairs, the second floor. I'm glad that uh, the outcome is that he's home resting and uh, he'll be back, back to work. The superintendent tells, us, uh, superintendent tells us that Matthew Dion will likely be arraigned tomorrow in Superior Court on two felony counts of assaulting corrections officers. We're live at the Valley Street Jail in Manchester. Amy Cavino, WMUR News Not. Okay, and there you go 
on that video and that report. Milford Restaurant Patron Leaves Generous Tip Bartenders say patron will remain anonymous. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Monica Fernandez. New Hampshire, your road to higher education. At Whitelands Community College, I am working with underserved... Bruce Gerard has been bartending here at the Pasta Loft in Milford for 16 years, but Friday marked a big first. Very surprising. Dumbstruck, I guess. I mean, you're just in awe, like still all week, just disbelief. Bruce and fellow bartender Karen Valancourt were serving a man they'd seen a few times before. It seemed like any other night until they saw the receipt. A $21 check with a $2,000 tip. I felt ill. <laughs> I started going through your so excited. I just felt ill. I'm just still in disbelief. Karen and Bruce split it, just like they do every Friday night. They plan to put the extra cash to good use. Going to fix my car. <laughs> I've taken my family out. We're going to go axe throwing in Manchester on uh, Thursday and then take my son out for dinner and uh, his girlfriend and the rest of the family out for dinner on uh, first birthday. As for the man who left the unexpected tip... A really low profile, just doesn't like a lot of attention, you know, and just does really nice things just because he can. And next time they see him... Probably say a big thank you. I'm going to buy him a drink. <laughs> okay, and there you go on that video and that report. U.S. features 0.28 lower open. U.S. stock index features were slightly lower Tuesday morning ahead of bank earnings. Podium order announced for CNN slash Des Moines registry Democratic presidential debate. Former Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont will stand at center stage in two days' night. CNN Des Moines Registry Democratic Presidential Debate. Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts will be on the left of Biden and former South Bend. Indiana Mayor Pete Buttigieg will be on the right of Sanders. Businessman Tom Steyer will stand next to Warren, and Senator Amy Kohlenbulcher of Minnesota will be next to Buttigieg. The debate, which will air on tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, exclusively on CNN, is the final face-to-face -face gathering of the candidates before the February 3rd Iowa caucus. CNN's Wolf Blitzer and Abby Phillip, as well as the Des Moines Registrar's Brianna, will moderate the debate at Drake University in Des Moines, Minnesota, Iowa. The podium order was based on an average of qualifying polls released in January. Candidates with the highest averages were placed in the center of the stage. Twenty-one Sadatis nationalists sent back to country after Navy base shooting. Let's take a listen to that video from ABC News. Good evening, 
it's great to start another week with all of you at home, and we begin tonight with an alarming development this evening. The U.S. is now expelling at least 21 Saudis who had come to this country for training, some of them flight training. But tonight, federal authorities say their extremist views were discovered in the wake of that deadly attack at the U.S. Naval Air Station in Pensacola. We reported here on the Saudi student armed with a handgun going on a rampage just weeks ago at that base. And tonight, the attorney general calling it an act of terrorism, quote, motivated by jihadist ideology. Three young sailors were killed and eight others were injured before the gunman was taken down. Tonight, what was discovered and why those 21 Saudis are being forced out of the U.S.? ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, leading us off. Five weeks after that horrific mass shooting at the Pensacola Naval Station, 21 Saudi nationals are being sent back to Saudi Arabia. This after authorities say they made a chilling discovery. At least 17 military trainees were found with jihadi literature and 15 with child porn on their computers. But I do think it's clear that we have to improve our vetting procedures. A sensitive issue for the U.S. considering 15 of the 19 hijackers in the 9-11 attack were Saudis. That Saudi pilot who gunned down three sailors and wounded eight others was a radical who the FBI says was secretly planning to kill his American colleagues for months. Just two hours before the shooting, Lieutenant Mohammed Saeed al-Shamrani was allegedly reading and posting jihadi messages on social media. He harbored anti-U.S. military and anti-Israel sentiments. And that he thought violence was necessary to defend Muslim countries. New evidence revealed today suggests al-Shamrani was planning a large-scale massacre. He had more than 180 rounds of ammunition for his handgun, which had an extended magazine. So far, the FBI has no evidence the gunman killed at the scene had others helping him. But agents are scrambling to access his two badly damaged iPhones. Authorities say Apple so far has been unwilling to help. It's the same problem investigators faced after the San Bernardino terror attack in 2015. We call on Apple and other technology companies to help us find a solution. We have heard that question before, and Pierre Thomas with us live again tonight from the Justice Department. And Pierre, uh, authorities do believe that these phones could be key to finding out whether the gunman had any accomplices? That's right, David. The FBI says they found no evidence of support, but it's clear they're extremely frustrated that they don't know what is on those two phones. And David, the FBI says the suspect intentionally shot one of those phones before he was killed. Right now, they have no evidence that any of those trainees knew about the plot beforehand. David? All right. Pierre Thomas leading us off tonight. Pierre, thank you. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. And that does it for this morning edition of the Riley King Newscast. Right here on the Riley King Network. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. And I'll see you back here later on today for another newscast. And I'll have a news report coming up in a little bit. Goodbye, everyone.